Jem Schofield here with the C47, and needless to say, it's been a while. This episode is a little different. I was up in Springfield, Massachusetts about two weeks ago. I was doing an event, um, part of uh, Berkshire Film Exchange, and it was a day where people came out to learn about uh, primarily the future of production. It was sponsored by Vitech, and I was the keynote, and I talked a lot about and also showed uh, a lot of stuff related to the future of production. So we had a lot of great equipment up there, a lot of great people, um, and it was a, a really good day. And I was there with somebody whom I have not taught with directly, but have been teaching in the same vicinity of for many, many years, uh, Gary Adcock who is based out of Chicago, and also the group from Vitek, who are a, a really great group of people, including Pat, who really is the, um, the guy who spearheaded uh, light panels, and, and it was great to meet him. Okay, so I'm digressing. After that event, I got in the car and drove uh, an hour and change away from Springfield and into seemingly the middle of nowhere, with uh, Jay Ignazowski, I hope I'm saying that correctly, and Gary Adcock. And we went to an amazing place where I got to meet for the first time Doug Trumbull. And if you don't know who Doug Trumbull is, I will put a link to his IMDB. He has made tremendous contributions to our industry in the area of special effects and technology. And he is doing some stuff that is just crazy sauce stuff out there in Massachusetts. In uh, 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 it's, it's like driving up a dirt road and into a studio complex. Um, the building we were in was pretty huge. I was very envious. What I build in Oregon won't be that large. There is a, um, as you will see in, in, in Doug's conversation with us, a, a thing behind him. <laughs> and we went in there, that theater, and we watched some amazing stuff. And really what I want you to do is just um, watch and listen to Doug. I'm not a big fan of 3D. And I think that one of the reasons that I'm not a big fan of 3D is because of how it's implemented. And Doug talks a lot about that and what he's been trying to solve related to that. Uh, I didn't know if I was going to be able to film him, so I just threw the uh, little M6 up with the built-in microphone and used Isotope RX to uh, clean it up a little bit. But he was gracious enough to allow me to roll camera on what he was talking about. And I think there's just a, a, a lot of stuff in there that's really amazing that for me was very eye-opening. Um, it doesn't mean that 3D is going to be for everything. But I think that what he's trying to do, both on the production side and also distribution from the viewer side theatrically, is absolutely amazing. So um, this is just to enjoy, to sit down and listen to um, a visionary, really a master of his craft. Uh, the fact that he not only worked on 2001 Space Odyssey, but worked on one of my absolute favorite films of all time, Blade Runner, um, meant that this was a, a super special treat for me. We don't get to do things like that very often, and I hope that this content is worthwhile to people who are interested in production in general and what we do and where we're going with our industry. Enjoy. 24 frames per second, invented in 1927, is the most enduring art form I've ever seen technologically. And if you want to tell a story, it's fabulous, you know. But when you want to do fast action, it's not fabulous. Mm -hmm. And when you want to do 3D, it's definitely not fabulous. Just because the frame rate's inadequate to all the blurring and strobing that's attendant to high fast action or stereoscopic space or anything else is just abysmally bad. And, you know, the, the short version of my story is that I, I grew up working early with Stanley Kubrick on 2001, 70 millimeter, and we, we experienced right then, when I was a kid, the problems of 24 frames, strobing and blurring and having to slow everything down for the big screen. 
and uh, it was very frustrating, but it was a big learning curve. And ever since then, I've been a big advocate of giant screens and you know large film formats and everything else, and all the visual effects that Richard Yurtsich and I did for years for all these movies were 70 millimeter. Um, and then uh, we developed the show scan process of 60 frame per second, which really solved fundamental problems for movies. It, got, it was single flash, so there's no double flashing, and, and you get a really smooth image on the screen. It was still only 2D, and it was 70 millimeters. It was a lot of film stock, and it was very expensive, and it just didn't get traction for the expense reasons and the bulk reasons. And so that that didn't really go anywhere, uh, except we did a you know a number of expo films and special projects and commercial projects. But as a business, it was faltering, and, and IMAX really controlled market share for the giant screen. Hmm. And uh, and IMAX was also 24 frames, but it was uh, you know super giant film frames, triple size, 15 per frames, and that was tremendously vivid hmm. on giant screens. But you still had to move very slowly. I mean, edit slowly and move slowly, or it just blurred and strobed mm -hmm. like crazy. And uh, and then IMAX went through, you know, the wrenching transition to have to go digital. There was just, there was no question that film was on its way out, and only one lab left, and Eastman Kodak bankrupt, and better move on. <laughs> and when IMAX made the transition to digital, they had to go 2K. That's all there was. And the entire business that they were servicing, the, the science museums, natural history museums, just got really angry mm -hmm. because it was such a diminution of what they had previously sold. They couldn't do the big screens, they couldn't get the brightness, they couldn't get the sharpness, they couldn't get the clarity, mm -hmm. couldn't get the color depth, and everything was bad about it. Anyway, um, now we're at this new place, which is what this whole facility is about is exploring well now we're now that we're digital what do we do with it because we have to reconsider all the standards technical standards I'm not talking about reconsidering aesthetic standards although I do that too but um, I found out through experiments we started doing here at 4k at very high frame rates that it was first time in my history I think the first time in anybody's that uh, digital can actually be far superior to any 70 millimeter process ever made. Mm. Uh, the quality of the image is just stunning. It's inexpensive. It's easy to do. It uses all off-the-shelf gear. Everything you see here is off-the-shelf. We don't have to invent cameras or projectors or Which editors. Which is a big thing with the projectors. Really important. Mm. So we, you know, when I found out that all the tens of thousands of projectors out there in the field already for the cinema industry are cruising along at 144 frames a second, and no one's using it. Huh. I thought, well, well why, not? why is that? <laughs> why not? You know. <laughs> and I called. This was very early on. It was like eight years ago. I, I called Texas Instruments, who were providing the DLP chips, and they said, well, the end of your industry only wants 24 frames, and so they had the front end of the DLP imager that they were selling had a 24 frame expectation. And then the, the multiple flashing of five or six flashes uh, were actually built into the head, and you couldn't change it. There was no way to actually access the chip and do a higher frame rate until things started progressing, and then they started releasing their um, constraints on that and letting Barco and Christie and NEC and other people who wanted to buy their chips have access to it for whatever frame rate they wanted because there was a big surge in simulation and medical applications and all kinds of stuff. So it became possible to put any frame rate you want. You know, those chips can go hundreds of frames a second. Mm -hmm. 240, 480, you name it. It's really not a stretch for the chip at all. It's just a stretch for the electronics to get that bandwidth to it. Um, and I started wondering if there wasn't a way to uh, leap beyond the the standard of video, because if you go high frame rate and you go right to video, it's going to look like video. And the fundamental thing I discovered in this process, which wasn't easy to come by, which is that um, digital projectors don't have shutters in them. Movie projectors have always had shutters in them. So part of the texture of a movie is that it's going on and off. You know, it's a 50% duty cycle. 
It's right. closed half the time, open half the time. Yeah. That's part of the texture of movies. That's independent of resolution, color space, brightness, or anything else. One of the other attributes of movies have it's always been like 15, 14, 16 foot Lamberts, because if you go brighter than that, it'll flicker because of the shutter. Mm. So it was the shutter that limited the upper brightness of cinema for its, you know, for almost a hundred years. So I say, okay, well, that's two attributes of cinema, which is shuttering and brightness. And um, and then when I started looking at video as we know it, you know, whether it's video on TV or on your smartphone or on your tablet or whatever, the shutter is not there. And it's much, it's very bright. The colors are very vivid. It's like 50 foot lamp, it's not 15. So it's multiples of everything. And it's not flickering. But the fact that it's still 24 frames, somehow the 24 frameness of it passes through as a movie. Mm. Everybody can tell the difference between a live TV show and a movie sure. on TV, right? I mean, it's just, we don't know what it is, but we can tell the difference. Yep. I know it when I see it. And so m movies at 24 frame pass through the video medium just fine, unobstructed. But when you put it on a big screen in a theater, it looks like a big TV because there's no shuttering and it's too bright. And I've been trying to figure out, well, how do we do this at a high frame rate and still have it look like cinema? That was the core thing that we discovered here. Hmm. And part of it came from the fact that um, 3D is alternating left eye, right eye. 99% of the theaters, 3D theaters, are single projector theaters. They're not dual projector theaters, they're single projector theaters. So by nature, it's alternating left eye, right eye, which means there's a shutter in each eye. It's just that they're out of phase. It's dark and light, dark and light. And so I said, oh, the shuttering is still there. Mm -hmm. So that's a good thing. Then one of the problems with 3D in the cinema industry is that they put the, the dichroic or, or polarizing filters, cut the light in half, then you put on the glasses, glasses, cut the light in half again, you end up with three or six foot Lamberts or less. The average around the world is around two to three foot Lamberts. Wow. It's abysmally dim. So, wow. So 3D has a very bad reputation for being too dim. Mm -hmm not bright enough right. because the theaters just chose not to compensate for all that by putting in bigger lamp houses or higher gain screens or whatever. So I just said, well, we have to restore back to 14 foot Lamberts. That's kind of the known standard. Get back to 14 foot Lamberts. And part of that is this screen, this toroidal screen. It's actually hemispherical, but it doesn't really matter. It's a three gain screen, which is tripling the amount of light coming back to the viewer. Mm. And by making it curved, we're focusing the light back to the seating area. We're not allowing light to scatter off to the ceiling or the wall of floors. We're capturing that light and corralling it back to the eyes of the audience. Mm. That recovers the light you're losing through the 3D system. So then we found out that we could go to almost, we can go to any frame rate we want and it still looks like cinema because the, the flickering is there. You can't see it, but it's there. And the brightness is appropriate for a movie. You can make it as big as you want. And it still looks like a movie. So you tell me when you see this, if it looks like a movie or not. Because if someone tells me this looks like a big TV set, I'm going to be very upset. <laughs> everybody shoots a stereo pair. So you've got to get your head around the idea that whether it's The Hobbit or a 3D movie or Avatar or anything else, those two frames are shot with 180 degree shutters mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Shutter goes dark, so half of what happened has never been captured. Yeah, it's gone forever. But and that's not then, what you're doing, right? and then they're going to get projected out of phase. Right. So you're 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 automatically introducing a discontinuity of motion. Got it. The same picture moment in time is now offset in time. Yeah. And it's the beginning of the discombobulation of what I call temporal continuity. Hmm. And whether you do 48, 60. 72 doesn't matter if you don't get the temporal continuity right you're going to have artifacts motion artifacts that are going to disturb the 3d space and be hard to watch and create eye strain and everything else so my mantra is single projector alternating left eye right eye we shoot the two frames out of phase right with one another so right. it's not truly a stereo pair it's a patented concept it's mm. protectable it's licensable. I don't want to interfere with anybody's ability to do it, but it's critical to the business aspect of raising money and getting investors to do this. 
and, um, and it's extremely simple and inexpensive. So now, by shooting those two frames out of phase, we're capturing 100% of what happened. There's nothing missing. Yeah. And if a car's moving fast, or a hockey puck is moving fast, or a fist is moving fast, or a car's exploding, or whatever's happening, we capture 100% of it in perfect temporal continuity. And you'll see everything, and it gets right into your And then you left system. the projection, the single projector, and what's happening with that. It's the viewing experience which brings back those. Yeah, we just make yeah. sure that it's yeah. projected in the right sequence, yeah. which is a no-brainer. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm also, I'm showing it very wide. The other important factor is, in my opinion, is that movies have always been a rectangular frame that's out in front of you. Whether it's a TV set or a tablet or a movie screen or whatever, it's a rectangular frame that's out here. Average field of view of about 50 degrees wide. Um, IMAX has been the leader in opening that up, you know, with the larger screen. And they are considered by the public as being like the gold standard of the giant screen thing. But they're taking 24 frames and doubling the width, but they're not increasing the frame rate. So the actual displacement from one frame to the next is increased. And it, it gets very hard for your eyes to do mm -hmm. what's called the fusion frequency or, or um, persistence of vision. And it becomes very stroboscopic and blurry because 24 frames is not enough. If you want to double the width of the screen, you need to double the frame rate right. to just stay at zero. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. when you do a screen width like this, which is our, from our front seat in this theater is similar to an IMAX theater. It's 110 degrees wide. You sit in the very front seat. The average seat is 80 to 90 degrees in the, in the middle of the theater. And that's what gives you this very wide field of view. And anybody in the world of flight simulation would tell you Pilots need a wide field of view. It's peripheral vision that gives you this kind of motion stimulation stuff. And so um, I wanted to develop a medium that doesn't uh, work on TVs. I, it's just not going to work. I mean, you could do it. It'll play. But um, it loses its impact. And so by having something that can go into movie theaters that is really powerful, spectacular, immersive, which is the the key word in VR right now, right. Um, that'll get people back into theaters. The roadblock that we hit once we got this going, we, we actually, that was our first screening room and that was, and we made the film right here where the pod is, which was our green screen stage. Hmm. We got it all done and we said, well, there's, let's go to LA and show the movie. <laughs> and I went and looked around LA and I went to all kinds of theaters in LA. There was no place to show it hmm. that could do what we do here. Hmm. Yeah. And I realized that the, that the exhibition end of the industry had just stuck, stuck with these narrow theaters sure. that are sometimes twice as deep as they are wide. Sure. And the screens are not even as wide as the end of the room, and it's the viewing experience is narrow. And then I realized, well, if you went the IMAX route, you could say you have to build new theaters from scratch. It'll be way beyond my personal lifetime before this ever yeah. gets any traction. And that's when we came up with the idea of doing these prefabricated theaters. These, will, these theaters, they're not going to be exactly like this, but they're going to be out of fireproof materials and meet building codes all over the world. And we're going to prefabricate them in large volume so that they're half the cost of a movie theater. Hmm. And you can plunk them in anywhere you want. Any place that's got a ceiling and a concrete floor, you're in business. So we assume that the space you're going to go into, whether it's a multiplex or a mall or a planetarium or a zoo, an aquarium, you name it, it's already got a floor and a ceiling. Sure. The HVAC is there, the toilets are there, the food service there, the parking is there, and it's a secure building. And all you got to do is get the shell up of the theater. And these, we'll be able to build these theaters in a week. I want to make movie making easy. I want to make it less expensive. And I want to make distribution easy and less expensive. And I want to make exhibition easy and less expensive and much more profitable. Hmm. That's, it's a simple equation to me. But getting everybody to agree on a new standard, I tell you, is like... A nightmare. The final side of the equation for me as a director writer is that the way you direct and the way you perform on camera unleashes all kinds of stuff that's always been forbidden. Mm -hmm. You know, breaking the fourth wall, mm -hmm. having the camera up really close to someone looking directly into the lens, that kind of thing is now open territory. Mm -hmm. We've discovered a new continent of content potential of these immersive experiences that are like first person experiences rather than third person experiences. Mm -hmm. 
and I'm trying to say, well, let's let's not try to bring back the past. Let's deal with our digital future and do something that actually is even better than that. 